everybody, it's Trevor Fagan here from Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, this is a pedal steel guitar and uh, I'd like to talk to you about uh, pedal steel guitars and how they evolved and how they work. Over the years throughout my career uh, I'd be doing shows and after the show you know people would come up and, and meet you and shake your hand and, and quite often I'd get a I'd get a compliment like hey bud you're a, you're an awesome keyboard player. Well that's totally fine uh, you know. To look at this up front you know from front on it looks a lot like you could be playing a keyboard instrument. But actually it's called a pedal steel and it's got, uh, you know, this one particularly has uh, 10 strings, has two necks, 10 strings per neck, a bunch of pedals, some knee levers, volume pedal, a bunch of For things. millennia practically, uh, people have been sliding things across strings to produce sounds to, uh, to make their own music. So in addition to talking about pedal steel, I'm going to take you back and we'll, we'll talk a little bit first about uh, the first instruments perhaps that people were known to slide on and how things evolved until we finally got to, to the pedal steel guitar. So some of the earliest uh, slide instruments are probably going to be found uh, in generally around West Africa where folks back uh, since you know the uh, for millennia have been uh, quite literally just taken a shell or a gourd or some other shell from a fruit or something and actually playing it on a hunting bow. And there's a record of, a, of an instrument uh, from, from West Africa that, were, that was designed to be played by adolescent children. It was an entry-level instrument. And basically it was a long, a long hunting bow. One child would, uh, would hit it with a stick, would tap on it with a stick to produce vibration, while the other child would take a, sh a shell or a gourd or some other you know, firm uh, hollow object and slide it along the strings and they'd make music together using it. Many of the modern instruments that we enjoy today are actually uh, are actually rooted in uh, primitive technology and playing techniques that were brought over uh, by the African peoples who were taken away from their homes during the slave trade and brought to America as slaves. As slaves, of course, there was very, very limited access to uh, musical instruments and in fact it was limited access to uh, items that you could make your own musical instruments out of. So from this came the development of an instrument called the diddly bow. So basically what it was, it was very simple. Uh, they would take a uh, wire from a broom, and in a lot of cases they would just take two nails, nail to the side of their, their cabin, or to a piece of, piece of wood that they've salvaged. Uh, they'd string that wire between the two nails, and they'd maybe use uh, bottles, glass bottles, or whatever they could find to uh, get tension on the string and adjust the pitch and they play it maybe with an old uh, you know some old medicine bottle or something that they could find around the farm. So I'm going to show you now what a diddly ball may have looked like back in those days. Basically it's just a piece of old, old wood. You put a nail in it, you use a bottle to to go over the to go under the string. And on the other end I put a can. Cans probably were a later development to resonate and to give you sound. So simply that's all it was. Pretty basic instrument. You adjust the tension uh, with with the uh, by moving moving the can one direction or the other or the bottle by sliding the uh, sorry by sliding the bottle one direction or the other you could change the pitch of the instrument. Very primitive instrument. It was uh, it was just basically a popular entry level uh, instrument among the slaves who really couldn't afford uh, really couldn't afford to own anything else. But they'd use these. These were like the early days of uh, where they'd get the rhythm, some syncopation going to uh, to sing along to actually sing some of their, uh, their their working songs that they'd sing in the field. Stuff that would keep them going and get them get them through the day. This is not a uh, proper cigar box guitar by, you know, by the true definition. It kind of gives you an eye there. It's basically just a uh, stick of wood. This one has three strings. Over time, they uh, they change the number of strings. 
And I, well, this one, I, I made this out of a couple of old hubcaps from my old car. But uh, yeah, you get the idea. And the slide is actually, um, if you can see that, the slide is actually just the neck off a wine bottle. So that's, that's likely that's likely the best they could do for a slide. I don't know if they had access to pipe and, and, and such. But uh, yeah, that makes a perfectly good slide and uh, it, it doesn't cost anything. Yeah, this perhaps uh, more closely resembles what a cigar box would have looked like. Uh, except this one's made out of license plates. <laughs> But you get the idea. It's that uh, piece of wood. It's got three strings on it, and um, it's tuned to an open chord, so it can be played with it with the slide very easily. In fact, uh, guitar legends such as Carl Perkins, Jimi Hendrix, and many others who grew up uh, in poverty, basically uh, from very poor backgrounds, uh, were likely to have played. Uh, Instruments based loosely on the diddly bow, which which the cigar box has evolved. Um, in fact, there's a famous uh, rock and roll and rhythm and blues legend uh, who was born by the name of Elias Bates McDaniel, who uh, right till the end of his career played a rectangular shaped guitar to resemble the cigar box. And in fact, uh, he took the stage name Bo Diddley, named after the, uh, the primitive instrument of diddly bow. <laughs> Africa, starting from the primitive hunting bow that was that was played as a musical instrument, through to the uh, the days of slavery and the Civil War when uh, the slaves developed the diddly bow, and then from the diddly bow evolved the cigar box guitar, and um, that that pretty much led us into uh, modern rhythm and blues music that we know today. Uh, also. Uh, there's been another group of people that had a, a great influence on slide guitars and slide instruments. The Spanish explorers and missionaries, when they went to Mexico, of course they bought with them something similar to what we know as the, the modern acoustic guitar that we see today. Over that period of time there's been numerous changes made to the design of it. Uh, but when they, when they first came and, uh, to Mexico and the Spanish brought it over and it started to gain some popularity, there was really not much in the way of, of information or training or lessons that you could get from playing it. So uh, modern guitar players, of course, you gotta, you got to learn a bunch of chords, figure where to put your fingers, that sort of thing. So what they did is they developed what they referred to as slack key tuning. So what they did, they actually took... So what they did, they, they, they basically dropped some of the strings down, they retuned the guitar so that instead of having to find a whole bunch of chord positions, they tuned it to an open chord. So, so without doing anything at all, it's already playing a chord for you. So with one finger only, all they had to learn was whether to go up or to go down the neck. So when Mexican cowboys were brought to Hawaii to, uh, to work on the Hawaiian cattle ranches, of course they brought their guitars with them. And as legend has it, uh, in the late 1880s, you know, a young Hawaiian uh, guy about 17 years old by the name of um, Joseph Kikuku was walking along the railroad track when he came across a railroad spike. So, just out of curiosity, he had his guitar with him, and he took the railroad spike and he... And he realized it made sort of a unique sound when he slid it along the strings. Well, young Joseph K. Kuku went away and he developed his playing technique using a bar of steel instead of his finger. And... Uh, and that playing style, once he developed it, it really took off in the early 1900s and became a really popular sound of what we refer to as a Hawaiian guitar today. Now, as unique as that sounds, and it really did take off. It was 
very, very popular, this Hawaiian-style music. But it wasn't very loud. And in 1926, a slide guitar player by the name of George Beecham approached a violin repairman by the name of John Dopiera to help him design a way to uh, make the guitar louder so it could be better heard alongside other instruments that were in the bands of the 1920s, including other acoustic guitars that were radiating the sound out front. The, uh, the lap players were at a disadvantage because their sound was kind of heading for the ceiling. So John Dopiera came up with a great idea. And remember, in the early 1920s, this is around the time that gramophones were popular, the record players, the old Victrolas, uh, they just had a mechanical horn, and around that same time they were starting to develop uh, the modern electric loudspeaker. So what John Dopiera did is that he made a guitar that kind of looked like this. Inside this metal cover, if you take this off, you'll see a metal cone, the same size, nice round cone, and it looks pretty much exactly like a modern loudspeaker. So if you took the stereo, for, uh, the speaker from your stereo or your guitar amplifier, if you look at the shape of that, that's what's inside of these. There's no electricity required. Uh, it just works off vibration. When the strings vibrate, it causes the flow, and the, uh, causes that cone, that speaker-shaped cone, to resonate, and it makes the guitar considerably louder. <laughs> And it makes a really nice, unique sound. So John Dopiera and his brother, they further developed this idea, and they founded a company that they called the Dopiera Brothers. And they took the first two letters from the, uh, the name Dopiera, D-O, and they used the first three letters of the word brothers, B-R-O. They put it together, and they created uh, what we know today as the Dobro. Later in the 1930s, the 1930s uh, saw the introduction of the er very earliest electric Hawaiian steel guitars. Now these were shaped much like a, uh, an actual acoustic guitar, but they were built much, much smaller and they featured uh, horseshoe magnets with metal rods and uh, windings of wire around them to pick up the oscillation from the strings as they vibrated. Uh, this was the introduction essentially of the very first electric guitar pickups. These instruments were quickly, uh, they quickly gained popularity in country and western music throughout the 1940s and 50s. These first electric uh, lap instruments actually grew legs in 1956 when Leo Fender of Fender Guitar fame uh, built the very first console guitar. As various tunings were developed for different styles of playing, Fender addressed this issue by adding additional necks. He just kept adding more and more necks tuned to a different key so that the player could, uh, could play in uh, different keys or different uh, tunings throughout the song. But having instruments, and eventually this is, a, this is one with two necks, this is a double neck, but having an instrument with three, four, five, six necks it's really not practical for players to use, so folks began exploring ways for the players to change the tuning on the fly while playing a song. From 1939 to 1948, several, uh, numerous, I guess, unsuccessful attempts were made to accomplish this little trick on both the earlier lap models and the newer console model style instrument. But finally, in 1948, a chap by the name of Paul Bigsby, uh, sorry, Paul Bigsby, uh, my motorcycle enthusiast friends will love hearing about this. He was actually a motorcycle shop foreman, and he invented a system of pedals, rods, cranks, and leakages, leakages that work. And the uh, modern pedal steel guitar players have been building upon Bigsby's design ever since. So lap steel to console guitar with no pedals, no gadgets underneath. On the other hand, uh, modern steel guitars, pedal steel guitars, have a whole bunch of pedals. And they have a whole bunch of gadgets underneath. A lot of rods connected to what they call bell cranks. These go back here to little fingers that are actually attached to the, uh, that the strings attach to. And this is what gives you the, the change of pitch. You see, if I move a, uh, a pedal, you can see, oops, it. As I move a pedal, you can see the, uh, the finger moving. And 
here's some pedals on this guitar as well. I'm not sure if you can see the undercarriage of this one very clearly. It's probably a little bit dark. But it's pretty much the same idea. And all the rods and pedals are connected here at the end of the guitar where the strings attach. And as you step on a pedal or activate a knee lever, You'll either uh, uh, increase the tension, you'll tighten certain strings, or you'll loosen them. It all depends on which, which pedal or knee lever that you're, you're activating. So uh, it gives you a whole range, pretty much an infinite range, of uh, different ways to change the pitch on, on various strings on the guitar. There you have it folks, uh, hope you enjoyed watching our little discussion on uh, everything from the diddly bow right straight up through the dobro, lap steels, console steels, cigar box guitars, all the rest right up until the modern pedal steel guitar. Thank you so much for watching.